Did you know there are international standards for file names? ISO and the IEC have rules that are designed to ensure compatibility within and between data systems. Your computer systems and software add a second layer of their own requirements. And then how we work also drives some of our needs for how we name files. Some of the ways we have, or rather haven't been taught to manage our files, make our lives harder. Understanding the easy options will save us time and frustration. We could have a really long conversation about all the technicalities. Instead, we're going to have a quick conversation about the elements of those standards that will best serve you. In computing, an illegal operation is one that's so confusing or unreasonable, the computer has a nervous breakdown and just quits trying. When we use illegal characters in our file names, we make it harder and sometimes impossible for the computer to handle our files. These characters will break things almost immediately. Others may only show a problem when you try to do specific things with the file at a later date. The best and safest practice is to stick to letters, numbers, spaces, and dashes. There are some programs and systems out there that can't handle spaces, but most people who are watching this video aren't going to encounter those, and spaces make our file names much friendlier on the human eye. So even though it's against some standards, I'm going to still recommend you go ahead and use them. Your file and folder names should have a maximum length of 20 characters. Well, okay, really it's more like 30, but if you aim for 20, you're more likely to keep it within 30, and you still have room to go over a little without a problem. You want to keep your folder structures to no more than three layers deep. More layers than that, in addition to making it a lot of work to reach your files, can actually break things. There's a limit to the number of characters that many applications can process, and when you exceed it, your files can become effectively unusable or unreachable. How you name your files can make a huge difference in how easy they are to find and use, even for you. If someone else has to access that information, good naming practices will be the difference between minutes and sometimes hours trying to find the right thing. Unfortunately, most of us name our files in the way that makes sense to us at the time we're saving them. The program we're using, the date, someone's name. This information is the least useful for someone else who has to find our file, or six months later, for us. If you're working in a team, the best option is to have a formal naming convention so everyone's following the same rules. But the same principles will still help you as an individual. First, name for retrieval. Rather than naming a file based on how you work with it or save it, name your file based on how someone else will look for it later. You might think of it as the contract I'm working on with Mary, but when you go looking for that file in a year, will those pieces of information help? Or would it be better to name by the vendor or the subject of the contract? Whatever naming rules you decide on, make sure the most important words come first. In a folder where every file is either a contract or a quote, contract and quote should be the last words of the file name. They're the last detail you'll be looking for when you go to retrieve the file. Start with the project name, customer ID, or whatever distinguishes this contract and quote from the other 500 contracts and quotes in that folder. All uppercase or all lowercase text is hard for the human eye to parse, and it gets even worse if you've used abbreviations to shorten the file name. Dashes work, but spaces read more naturally. Think about the files you've seen and what made their names hard to decipher. Spaces, no spaces but capitalizing each word, these make the stream of text easier to parse and will make your file names easier to read and understand. For the most part, using dates and file names is a waste of characters. The date your file was created, modified, or accessed is part of your file's properties. However, there are some occasions where you do need to use them. For example, if you're storing meeting minutes, the date identifies which meeting's minutes they are. If you have to include dates in your file names, use the international standard. Year, two-digit month, two-digit day. This ensures that your files will sort in the correct order when they're sorted as text in your file system. Watch for space wasters like letter and draft. When someone's looking for this file later, will it matter if it's called a letter, a memo, or a note? The topic does more to help you find the file. In the case of letters, the name of the addressee might be useful. For meeting minutes, the date is essential. But in most cases, dates and people's names don't tell you what's inside. Ask yourself whether these elements will help someone identify the content. Now I mentioned the word draft, 
And really, this tips over into another important rule. Keep one copy of a file. Multiple copies and multiple versions aren't usually a benefit. They're a source of confusion. Invariably, the copies of copies of copies result in nobody knowing which one is the right one. The drafts never get revisited or deleted. In the end, these become stacks of stuff that you have to wade through to find the actual files you need. If it's a draft, add a watermark that says draft and remove it when the document is done. If you need to indicate a version, put it in the footer. But what if you need that earlier version? Or if someone messes up your file? If you use cloud storage, such as OneDrive and Google Drive, check to ensure that file versioning is enabled. If so, each time your file is saved, the copy is kept in the file's version history. If someone has overwritten your file and you need the correct version back, you can select it from the version history and restore it over the top. Need to retrieve a detail from that draft copy? Download the earlier version. With versioning, the extra copies are just extra. Two common types of files have special rules, email and web pages. Saving a web page or dragging an email out to the file system results in the creation of a bunch of tiny little files. Computers allocate disk space in blocks. A huge file might use hundreds of blocks, but an email can be as small as a twentieth of a block. Since the computer can't allocate a partial block, your one little email message gets the entire thing, and that's a great reason to leave it in your mailbox. If you do need to save emails or web pages individually, consider saving them to PDF. Having hundreds of tiny little files leaves your computer scrambling to manage all the little bits of file it has scattered about. It slows down your computer's performance. If you're saving to a shared file server, the server slows down for everyone. Finally, a quick word about the best ways to protect your files. If you're worried about accidental changes, we've already discussed how to recover from them using versioning. But in situations where you have partners who don't need to be able to collaborate, but just to see your files, the best solution is to leverage permissions. Share read-only. One thing that may not be as good an idea as it seems is using your word processor's password feature. These are great for your home files, but can be extremely problematic in a work environment. If the password is lost or forgotten, there's no way to gain access to that file. Well, okay, I suspect the vendor probably can decrypt it, but as a matter of policy, they'll tell you they can't and they won't do it for you. Anonymous sharing is innately less secure, but sometimes you do need to provide those links. When you do, you'll often get extra options to balance the security. These images are from OneDrive, but your cloud provider will have similar options. It's worth taking a little time to learn about your provider's features as each has different limitations. For example, my OneDrive's block download option prevents recipients from downloading or printing my document, which is great. But it's important for me to know that while it works on PDFs created natively, it doesn't work on PDFs created by Adobe Acrobat. Changing habits is hard, but these ones will serve you well. Here's the short list you can put on a post-it next to your computer. Short file names with legal characters, usable folder structures, name the file for retrieval, name based on what's inside, not who hit the keys or using categories like memo and draft. Keep one copy. On the rare occasion that you need that lost copy, let versioning do the work. If you have to keep email and websites, save to PDF. Use permissions rather than passwords to protect files. These habits will help you store, retrieve, and find your stuff much more easily. I'm Nixie, and this has been Nixie Knows. Thanks for spending time with me today. If you learned something useful, please click like so that YouTube will be more likely to show someone else that's something useful too. If you know exactly who needs to see it, click share. Make sure they get a chance to come spend a few minutes with me too.